several things. First of all, uh, the birthday party for Sister Lois is this Saturday. Uh, this is her 90th birthday party. This is here at the church from 1 to 3. Uh, fellowship, uh, it'll be in our fellowship hall. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board uh, for that. Our senior trip is planned for Thursday, October 24th, uh, leaving the church at 1030. All right, 10.30 a.m., sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. We're going to be going to McCall's Barbecue and Seafood Restaurant. Always a good time just to kind of get away and eat together and fellowship with one another. So I hope you'll make plans to go to that. Our Trunk or Treat Community Outreach is Saturday, October 26th, last Saturday of the month. That's from 4 to 6 here at the church. Uh, we're going to be having all kinds of different games. If you could decorate your trunk, and our folks have just done a great job with this in the past, coming up with all kinds of different ideas and games for our kids to play and enjoy. You know what? I would rather our kids be here uh, than out knocking doors on people they don't even know, getting candy, who knows what they're getting, and all kinds of different environments. And so this is a good, safe environment for them to be in, probably have a bounce house out there something for them to play in, and just lots and lots of sugar that just keep them wired all the way through the weekend, all right? So, but anyway, that's coming up. If you can help decorate or you can help by bringing in some treats, uh, please do that and put them in the fellowship hall on the table at the very end. Wednesday morning Bible study. And now, this is different. I've been mentioning this over the last several weeks. We've changed the date. We've delayed it two weeks. But November 6th is our first Wednesday morning Bible study back. Uh, again, as I mentioned this morning, Wednesday morning Bible study, and then the same in the evening. It'll be the same lesson, same Bible study. Um, uh, again, a little different each time, but uh, I hope you'll make plans to be a part of at least one of those. Uh, and then the ladies' annual Thanksgiving Pie and Praise service is Tuesday, November 26th. That's at 6.30. Sign-up sheet for desserts. Uh, will be up on the bulletin board very soon. October Riddle, last chance uh, is Wednesday night to put your guess in. All right, If you think you know the answer to the riddle that's in the bulletin for this month, I hope you'll put that in there. Don't forget, I say this every month, and there's folks that do this every... I don't know if you're just... I, I don't want to win. I just want to put in the right answer. Maybe that's you, and that's fine if you do that. But I always have slips every month with no name. I don't know who put it in there. And uh, so anyway, make sure you write your name on there. That way you're eligible to... Uh, get into the, um, the books and things that we have here as giveaways. All right, that's all the announcements I'm going to mention tonight. So at this time, I'll ask uh, Brother Johnny and our other Brother Ray to come, and we'll receive this evening's tithes and offerings. By the way, if you weren't here Wednesday night while they're coming, we uh, kind of laid out a, a vision for the future of Good News Church. And if you would, good news, what am I doing? I'm back in York. I'm back in York, all right? Macropine, all right, Macropine. I'm uh, not planning on going back as far as I know, all right? But, but anyway, for Macropine Church, uh, just some, the next steps. And the first step, we're already on it, is a renovation of our nursery. Um, but then some steps after that, some, some big, big plans. I would consider them big plans. But we know that there's nothing impossible for God. And if this is the direction that God wants us to go in, he'll provide the necessary funds and, and needs will be met. So if you would like to have a copy of that um, I guess you could call it the drawing uh, for future plans. If you'll see me, I'll get you a copy, and you can take a look at those next steps for the future of Macropine Church. All right? Brother Ray, we ask the Lord's blessing over the offering tonight.
before we sing our last hymn tonight, and when I say that, I hope it's not the last one we ever sing. <laughs> it's just one for tonight. Uh, I'd like to make an announcement we made this morning. Next Sunday, we're going to be taking a special offering uh, for our pastor. It is a pastor appreciation offering. We do it every year in October, and we would ask you to come prepared next Sunday morning uh, to give to that cause. Uh, he's done a good job, and let's show him how much we appreciate him. Hymn number 297, Whosoever meaneth me. Just say one thing, uh, Brother Ray has been out sick today, and please uh, pray for him. I got a personal stake in this too, so pray hard. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Bob. Brother Bob always does a good job, doesn't he? Um, well, we started something this past uh, Sunday evening. And uh, that was, we, we were starting to learn a course, Somebody's Praying. And um, each week, each Sunday night, we're going to be praying for someone specifically. And just kind of directing our prayers and, and making them more specific instead of general prayers. Instead of God save the world, you know, God, every, God make everybody well, God meet all of our needs. Uh, we're talking about specific things. And so once again, we're going to ask you to do that. But before we get to that, I want us to sing our chorus together, Somebody Praying. Somebody's Praying. And uh, you'll remember from last week, so help me sing it tonight.
Um, are all of our children still in here? Has any of them gone out? There's one in the nursery. Who is that? Draco. All right. I want all of our kids to come back up here on stage for me. Can we do that? All of our kids. I'll let you go back. I know you're working on your bulletins for tonight. And they do such a good job in the service every week, you know, trying to. Look, I know we talk about grown-up stuff on Sunday nights. And, uh, and it's hard to pay attention for that entire time, especially when most kids' attention spans, I think now, are down to about five to seven minutes, if it's that long, all right, with some. Uh, but uh, anyway, I appreciate our children so much. And you know what? The cool thing about every single one of these kids, God made every turn. Let me turn this on so you can hear me. Thank you. God made every single one of these kids with a purpose in mind, with a plan in mind. He had something that he wanted to see done, and so he created each one of these young people to do whatever that something was. And I'll tell you what, they're going to be facing a whole lot in their lifetime. They're going to be facing all kinds of, they're going to be facing things that you and I never faced. Worse things than we ever faced. So what I want us to do as a church tonight, I want you to pick out, look up here at these beautiful faces, all right? these handsome and beautiful faces up here on stage, and I want you to pick out one or two of them, just one or two of them. You may not even know their name tonight, but you know their face. You're looking right at them. And I want you to pray especially for them tonight, that God's hand would be upon them, that God would give them the right kind of friends in their life, that God would direct them to his will, and then they would be willing to do whatever God's called them to do. Would you help me pray for them tonight? All right. You got somebody in mind? You got a face, a couple faces? All right. Well, let's pray for them tonight. You guys help us pray too, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for every single one of these that are on stage. And Draco in the nursery. Lord, we know that you created them. You gave them life. And you gave them a life to live for you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide them, that your hand would be upon them, uh, Lord, we know that you want to do something great in their life. But, well, Lord, we also know that there's a devil out there who is going to tempt them, who's going to try to get them sidetracked and get them to do other stuff other than your plan for their life. Lord, I pray that you'd wrap your arms around them, show them that you love them, you care about them, wrap your protecting arms around them, and, Lord, keep them on the right path. Give them the right friends in this life. Help them to make the right choices. And Lord, I pray that they would choose to love you with all their heart, their soul, and their mind, and they would choose to serve you all their days. Lord, we anticipate with excitement what they're going to do in their life for you. We pray that they would do greater things than we've done for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We love you guys. You can go back to your seat, all right? And Eliana, yeah, Eliana is in their seat too. So we pray for Eliana too. I bet I guarantee you we had a mama praying for her right there. Yes, yep. And I and look, this is not all of our kids too. Uh, there were there were other kids uh, that are not here with us on Sunday night that were here this morning. By the way, have you noticed this row on Sunday morning? Have you noticed we've gone to about two rows on Sunday morning some weeks? God is blessing us in the department of our young people, and we are so thankful for that. One of the greatest, greatest sights in all the world I saw tonight when I, when I pulled up outside and I made my way up to this door out here. You know what it was? All on that door, the sunlight was hitting that door just right. There were handprints, little handprints all over the door. And, you know, it's very easy. It's, oh, those kids are messing something else up. They, they got their handprints. No, that is a sign of growth. That is a sign that God is blessing our church. And I hope he fills our doors full of little handprints. I, I hope they're, they're all over the place. And so I hope you'll join me as we've done tonight. I hope that we'll continue to pray for our kids, be an encouragement to each one of them. You know, just plant those little seeds, you know, as you have little conversations with them. You know, God could call you to be a preacher one day. 
You know, God could call you to be a Sunday school teacher one day, a children's church worker. Who knows? God could call you to be a missionary one day. Hey, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know, most kids usually have an answer. It's, I don't know. Or maybe they have something in mind. But the greatest thing, greatest answer they could ever say is whatever God wants me to be. So I think we ought to be pointing our kids in that direction all the time. Thank God for the kids that he sent us. Thank God for the kids he continues to send and the ones that are not even here yet. All right? One's arriving maybe right now as we're, we're, we're having this conversation with one another, but others that God will send our way. May our church always have its doors flung wide open for as many kids as God wants to bless us with. Amen? Well, take your Bibles. Turn to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. You'll recognize this passage of Scripture. This is where we were last Sunday night, and this is part two of that message. And uh, we'll try to do a little bit of review uh, to catch us up to what we talked about last week. But we're talking about foolish request. And if you will look in Judges chapter 8, if you'll look at verse 22, it says, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, and the Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And we're going to stop there in our reading. We'll look at some other verses as we go through the message. But you'll remember in our last message, we said that because of the freedom, this newfound freedom that the Israelites now had because their enemy, the Midianites, how long did the Midianites oppress God's people? Seven years, seven long years. But now those chains have been flung off. They now have this newfound freedom. And because of that new freedom, it led to the people making a request to Gideon and then Gideon making a request of the people. And of course, both of those requests were filled with trouble. It would have been better if neither one of those requests would have ever been made. And of course, they revealed through these requests how far Israel had gone down spiritually. They were a long way from God by making this request. The evidence is there. And then, of course, these requests laid the groundwork for more trouble, more problems for Israel in the future. The request that the people made uh, for Gideon was for him to be their king. And we see that in verse 22, one of the verses that we just read. The men of Israel, keep in mind, were not asking Gideon just to be their king. They wanted Gideon to set up a dynasty. They said, Gideon, we want you to be our king, but we also want your son to be the next king, and your grandson to be the next king, and your great-grandson, and all the way down the line. Set up a dynasty of kings for us. Now, it was a good thing. We talked about this. It was a good thing they wanted to honor Gideon. He deserved honor. I mean, look what God had done through him. Throwing off the chains of the Midianites, this this oppression that they had been under all this time, and and had done it in a miraculous way. And so it was a good thing to honor Gideon. He deserved it. But the problem was, although they honored Gideon, they left out God. Nowhere in their speech, nowhere in their request, do we find that they bothered to honor and praise God for this. Of course, the main reason they wanted the king was because they wanted to be like the heathen nations that were around them. They wanted to be like the world. God wanted to be their king. And so by accepting the world, wanting to be like the world, what were they doing? They were rejecting God. They were saying, God, we don't want you to be our king. We don't want you to have priority in our life. We want to be like the world out there. And let me emphasize this again. Wanting to be like the world and have what the world has will always be bad ideas. That's a bad thing. Putting our wants over what God wants is never a good thing. It almost always ends in disaster. The best thing about this request that they made to Gideon was that Gideon turned it down. That's the best thing we can say about it. Gideon flat out said no. And I'm sure that it probably had to be very uh, very tempting for him to, to... By the way, every temptation is tempting, right? If it's not tempting, it wouldn't be a temptation. 
And so it had to be very tempting to him to take, but to his credit, he said, no, God is going to be your king. God should be your king. There were four things we began talking about these, four things about this temptation that we see in many temptations. Probably whatever gives you trouble, whatever tempts you, you see these things uh, involved in it. And, and, and make temptation so appealing to us. And we started looking at them. The first thing is that temptation was popular. This is what the representatives from each tribe came in, and they said, this is what we want. And because they were the representatives, they said, well, this is what the people want. This is what everybody wants, Gideon. And I'm sure all of us have experienced this. Because temptation can be pretty tough to say no to if everybody is for it, or it seems like everybody's for it, or everybody's involved in it. Peer pressure is a powerful thing. And by the way, peer pressure can work both ways. It can work for good, it can work for, for bad. But, but just because something is popular never makes something right. Matter of fact, we should be careful about whatever it is if everybody's for it. If everybody's for it, we need to say, wait a minute, hold on, let's think about this. Why would everybody be for this? Now, don't take that in mind next time we have a business meeting, all right? All right, now, don't even think about that the next time. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say, oh, well, everybody's for it, so I'm going to be against it. No, don't go in that direction, all right? If it's a good thing, everybody can be for it. But if all the world is for it, if it's popular out there in the world and everybody's singing its praises, look out, there might be an issue, probably is an issue with it. The second thing we see in Gideon's temptation is that the temptation was rewarding. This temptation offered Gideon fame, it, it offered him honor, it offered him uh, power, it offered him wealth, and it promised the same thing for his family. Keep in mind, future generations, right? Setting up a dynasty. So everything that was going to be get, given to Gideon would be passed down to his descendants. Had to be hard things for Gideon to, to turn down. Temptation is the same with us. It holds things in front of our faces that looks appealing to us. Money, promotion, security, power, status, pleasure, luxuries, all kinds of other things that the devil can use to get our attention. And by the way, he will keep trying things until he gets our attention. He never stops. He's like a good fisherman, right? You throw that lure out there, nothing's biting, what do you do? You put a different lure on, you try a different bait until you can get the fish's attention. Look, the devil's tackle box is full of temptation and he'll throw everything at us until he gets us to turn in that direction he knows he's got our attention and then he keeps throwing it and throwing it and throwing it until we bite it these things temptation what does temptation promise us those things promises us all all of these things that i just mentioned if if we give in that's the whole thing we got to give in to that temptation the problem with temptation is that although it may look good for a while, the end result is never going to be good. We thought it was going to be satisfying. We thought it was going to give us everything we were looking for, but it never happens that way. Most of the time, if not always, it's only a mirage. It's just sitting out there as promising this wonderful oasis, this wonderful, pleasurable experience, but when we get there, it's not what it promised to be. Sinful temptation always leads us to somewhere we, want, we don't want to go. The third thing we see about Gideon's temptation is that it made sense. If temptation didn't make any sense to us, we wouldn't fall for it. Israel needed somebody to be their leader, right? They didn't have a leader. They needed a leader. And doesn't it make sense if Gideon was that somebody? Because without that somebody, then Israel would once again be weak they would once again be vulnerable to the enemy. Gideon had to be the man. I mean, he was the one that stepped up when nobody else would step up. He was the one that was strong. He was the one that led the men into battle to conquer the enemy. So logically, if Gideon would be their ruler, and then later on his sons and grandsons would be their ruler, then they would always have victory and security over their enemies. See how much sense that makes when you put it that way. But here's the problem with that kind of thinking. And it's the same with all temptations. It all sounds good because it's playing on human logic and human emotions. But temptation always tries to hide the truth from us. The truth is, in this situation, Israel already had a king. 
God, right? God was the one who had brought this great victory, not Gideon. Gideon didn't bring this. I mean, I mean, how in the world is Gideon going to win a battle with those weapons that he had and doing it the way that he did it? It would be foolish if Gideon was out there on his own. So it wasn't Gideon that brought this victory. God was the one who would protect them against future enemies. Not Gideon, not any other man. But temptation failed to mention that. And that's what temptation does. It leaves out the details. It leaves out what could happen if I follow after this temptation. Think about this. If temptation didn't seem reasonable, at least at the present time, we'd never fall for it. And that's why temptation only shows you the here and now. It doesn't tell you what's waiting in the future. Besides, our decisions to right and wrong should never be based on our emotions. You know why? Because our emotions are all over the place. Now, even the most even of killed people that go through life and, it, and, and they act like nothing ever bothers them, I promise you, I promise you, their emotions are like this all the time inside. It, they may not show it on the outside, but it's happening on the inside. And that's why we don't base right and wrong on that. We don't base right and wrong on human logic. Because we get things wrong. I mean, how, how, how many times have we gotten things wrong? You know, we, uh, there's, there's this uh, lesson sheet that I'll, I'll give jo uh, Josh every once in a while in math, and it's just a whole bunch of problems. You know, maybe 30 or 40 problems. And he has to go through as quickly as possible, uh, you know, and, and try to get them all right. But a lot of times he gets so concentrated on how many, of, how am I, you know, where am I at? How many am I getting right? You know, how far? And he's looking at the time and he's doing all. And almost every single time, and you probably remember doing the same thing when you were in school, you get down to the end and you look back at the answers and you're like, I knew the answer to that. Why in the world did I put that answer down there? I mean, I knew what two plus two. Why in the world did I put 16? I mean, that makes no sense at all. Because we're human. Because we make mistakes. And that's why you don't base right and wrong on our, your own thinking, on human logic. What do we base right and wrong on? We base it on God's Word. Why? Because it never changes. So that's what these folks should have done. They should have said, you know what? God needs to be our king because he'll never get it wrong. He'll never lead us in the wrong direction. The final thing we see about Gideon's temptation is that it came at a perfect time. One of the most vulnerable times for temptation to strike is after some success. Commentator John Butler said this, when we reach the mountain peak of success, the air is thin, and we are not careful, if we are not careful and cautious, we will get heady, dizzy, and then fall. You know what? That's using some picturesque language there, but he's exactly right. There's two things that come along with success that makes us very vulnerable to temptation. There is euphoria and there's pride. And you experience those two things almost with every single success. Euphoria, when we're successful, we become excited. Our spirits soar. We think nothing can conquer us. Nothing can bring us down. We're just, we're just up here, right? And then pride. Pride just makes us an easy pushover. The Scripture teaches us, Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before what? A fall. Pride does that for, to us. And it all comes after success. In the Old Testament, there's a king there. His name was Uzziah. 2 Chronicles 26, verses 15 and 16 tell us about him. This is what it said. He was, or this is what it says. He was marvelously helped till he was strong. Now, that's a good thing, right? That's, that's talking about success. He was marvelously helped until he was strong. He was doing good. He was up here. He's got euphoria, but he also had something else. He had pride. And the scripture says, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Success is not, a nece it's not necessarily evil. Success is a good thing. We all strive for it. But it can make us vulnerable for, to temptation to strike if we're not careful. So here's the good news. Temptation can be tough to overcome, but it can be conquered. And here Gideon shows us how to do that. There's three important ways in which Gideon did this. First of all, he was adamant. They asked him to be their king. He was adamant in his answer. His answer was firm, it was forceful, and it was very plain. Look back in verse 23. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. 
Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. That's strong language, firm language. There's no beating around the bush here. It was an emphatic, no, I'm not being your king. Folks, that's the only way to handle temptation. Anything less than that, the devil will get his foot in the door. And I'm telling you, once he gets his foot in the door, it's hard to close that door. So some may say, well, Gideon, I mean, he could have been a little nicer in his response, don't you think? I mean, he, he could have used a softer answer, or, you know, been a little more courteous to these people. I mean, they were just asking a question, a request. That's all it was. But here's the truth. We don't owe temptation a nice answer. We just need to remember what evil is going to do to us if it gets in the door. It reminds me of how Charles Spurgeon, I never knew this this past week. This is a new story for me. But Charles Spurgeon once uh, an offer was made to him by P.T. Barnum. We know that name, right? P.T. Barnum. Uh, the Barnum and Bailey Circuses, right? P.T. Barnum, Barnum was a showman, right? He was always trying to get the latest and greatest act. He was always trying to, to be a success and draw these great crowds. He offered Charles Spurgeon a very attractive offer one time. He told him that he would pay him $1,000 per lecture which would have been a whole lot of money back then, $1,000 per lecture uh, he would give to uh, Spurgeon, and then P.T. Barnum would get to keep all the other receipts, right? He, everything else that came in, which would have been a whole lot of money. At that time, Spurgeon was packing his church out every single week. Everywhere he went to preach, he drew great crowds. And so this would have been a lot of money to come in. And so he gave that request to Spurgeon. He said, Spurgeon, I want you to come to America, and I want you to preach. I'll let you preach in one of my big tents and we'll draw a big crowd and I'll pay you $1,000 every single lecture. I don't know how many lectures he was going to do in a day. But again, that's a lot of money. I, I love his response. And again, some people might think this is harsh. But he wrote back to P.T. Barnum, Spurgeon did. He said, Acts, uh, you will find my answer in Acts 13.10. In Acts 13.10, this is what it says. O full of subtlety and of all mischief, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Man, that's a strong response, isn't it? Some, some might even say, well, that's kind of offensive. That's, that's a rude way of responding. I mean, all he was doing was offering him opportunity. But I'll say this, by responding the way that Spurgeon responded, he didn't give in to temptation. He took care of it right there. He nipped it in the bud, as I mentioned this morning in Sunday school. And he didn't hurt his reputation by going down the wrong path. The second way Gideon handled this temptation was that he denied himself. By refusing this request, again, all those attractive things that we mentioned a while ago, he was turning those things down. All those things could have been his. The fame, the fortune, the wealth, the power, the prestige, all of that could have been his. And for his family, he denied himself. You know, we live in a day where folks don't deny themselves of much of anything. If we want something particular to eat, what do we do? We go out and get it. I mean, if, if we want something, you know, for, particularly for our home, what do we do? We go out and buy it. Or we get on Amazon and order it. But most of what we buy, tell me this is not true, most of what we buy, we don't need. We just want it. But that's the day in which we live. There's not a whole lot of self-denial happening a lot today. Hey, hey, added to this is the thinking that most of our society has is that we are entitled to it. Entitlement. You hear that all the time. I'm entitled to have a house. I'm entitled to have a car. I'm entitled to have a job and insurance and food on my table. Look, even in a lot of preaching that you hear on TV and on the Internet today, you hear that God owes us something. All right, I'm going to take a time out right here, all right? We'll get back to the message in a time out. Listen to me. God doesn't owe us anything. The only thing that we deserve is hell. And anything that God gives us above that, and he gives us a lot, is only by his grace and his mercy. So it's not right for us to say, God, you owe me this. I'm entitled to this. No, we need to fall on our faces before God and say, thank you, thank you, thank you that you give me all these things and I don't deserve any of them. 
let me get back on my point. If we buy into this philosophy that we're so important, that everything is owed to us, and everything is about me and me and me and me, and everything that I've got and everything. Listen, we are setting ourselves up for temptation because there's always going to be those things out there that will tempt us. If that's our philosophy, if that's our thinking, self-denial is essential if we're going to win against temptation, especially with the things that the devil throws to us, then uh, throws at us. And then the final way that Gideon overcome temptation is that he honored God. And this is so important. Gideon refused to request. You remember what he said? Look back at the verse. He says, the Lord shall rule over you. He said, don't honor me. You honor God. And, and I find that when you do that, that erases the pride out of our life. That, that closes that door of temptation. The devil can't get to us then. If we'll just say, you know what? It's all about God. My attention's on God. Praise goes to God instead of me. When we insist on giving God first place, we insist on acknowledging God's word as our spirit, supreme authority and we insist on honoring him instead of honoring us we'll conquer temptation temptation will be conquered instead of temptation conquering us so that was the first request the request of the people to gideon now let's look at the second request real quickly all right i know some of you are all right i can't believe this not over yet all right but anyway all right so let's look at the second request what was it gideon asked the people for an offering and I'm telling you, this is headed for trouble, too. Look at verse 24. All right, Judges chapter 8, verse 24. It says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings. All right, the earrings were made out of gold. Now, these would have been the things that were collected from the enemy. These were the spoils of war. And Gideon, he especially, he had his eyes on those golden earrings because he has something in mind. He wants to use those earrings for something. If you read on down through the verses, in verse 27, it tells us in just a moment, he wanted to make an ephod. An ephod so that he could put it in Ophrah. I didn't say Oprah, but Ophrah where he lived. All right, He wanted it in that town in which he lived. Well, let's look at verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophir. There's the spelling of it. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it. I wish the story could have ended with Gideon just saying, no, I'm not going to be your king. Let God be your king. He needs to be your king. If that would have been the case, that would have been a wonderful ending to a great victory that God brought his people but it doesn't end there. I mean, just like that, he goes from a great victory to a great defeat. In one breath, he turns down a temptation and then he yields to another temptation. So I want us to look at three things about Gideon's request. First of all, let's look at how the people responded. They didn't respond the same way that Gideon did. Gideon said, no, I'm not doing that. The people said, okay, we'll do it. We'll give you what you want. And so, look at verse 25, and they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and then cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. They gave Gideon what he asked for. Now, the weight that's talked about in verse 26, if you read down through that verse, translated into our weight of the amount of gold that was there, it's somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds. All right, 50 and 60 pounds were collected. That's a lot of gold, a lot of earrings, right? But you've you got to keep in mind how many, how many of the enemy did they defeat, right? That's a lot of enemy. That's a lot of people. Probably all wearing earrings. So what would that be worth today? I was curious, and so I looked it up this past week. As of this past Friday, gold, gold is worth $2,646 per ounce. Anybody got any gold want to give me? All right. Um, $2,646 per ounce. If you multiply that by 16 ounces, which is one pound, we get $42,336. But we're not done yet. That amount has to be multiplied by the lowest number. We said between 50 and 60 pounds. Let's just take 50, and we get $2,116,800. 
in our currency today. I'd say that was a pretty good offering he took up that way that day, man. All right, can you imagine the next offering that we take up getting two million one hundred sixteen? I mean, that that solves all of our issues for I don't know how many years down the road, right? That that's a huge offering he took up. Now, as we're going to see later, Gideon, the cause that he took up this offering for was not a good good cause. But yet the people gave this big offering anyway, not knowing what it was going toward. They didn't know what he had in mind to do with these earrings. They just said, okay, well, we'll just give what we have to you. Now, I think one of the lessons that we can learn here is this. Be careful what you give your money to. Do your homework. Research it. Find out what it's all about. Don't get caught up in the emotion of, of giving. Don't get caught up because everybody else is giving toward that. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but I promise you probably all of us have done this. You've given money towards something and later on you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Mm. You found out what was behind it. Be careful what you give your money to. Make sure it's a good cause. On the other hand, if it's a worthy cause, if it's something worthwhile, something that, that is God honored, we ought to give. If God impresses upon our heart, I've been there, you've probably been there too. You've been in service, you know how much is in your wallet, how much is in your purse. And God impresses upon your heart, you need to give. And then we hesitate, how much? And God lays something on our heart. And then we start the bargaining, right? Well, God, you know, I got this amount in there, but, you know, I'm going to need this for this over here, and I'm going to need this for this over here. What about if I give this much instead of that much? That ever happened to any of you? It's happened to me. You know what the best thing in the world we can do? Here it is. God, what do you want me to give? Okay, that's, that's what you do. You know why? Because God not only gave you what's in your pocketbook and in your purse, but he'll also replace it and more. He always does that. So if you're obedient, God will honor your faithfulness. Second, notice what the offering was for. I just mentioned that. He wanted to make an ephod. You'll remember in the Old Testament, an ephod was a garment that was worn by the high priest. Only the high priest wore this ephod. It was very beautiful, it was elaborate, it was rich, it was a bejeweled garment. The scripture says it was made of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and fine twined linen, and skillful work. It represented a special position of high priest. What did the high priest do? The high priest was the only one that could go before God on behalf of the people, and also receive revelation from God, messages from God. That was his job. That was his calling. God had placed him in that position. It represented a high spiritual privilege, position, and esteem. So the question is, what does Gideon want with an ephod? Gideon wanted to function as a special spiritual leader for Israel. He wanted that authority. He wanted that position. He wanted the respect. He wanted the privileges of being a high priest and this ephod would kind of sort of give him that not on the inside but on the outside his perception in front of the people now why was this wrong on so many levels let me give you a couple of them first of all israel already had a high priest the high priest the tabernacle was located in shiloh god had already ordained somebody for that position but since the people had strayed away from God before the Midianites came in and oppressed them, Gideon took it upon himself to say, you know what, that guy wasn't doing his job. He wasn't being, so I'm going to assume that role, and I'm going to take that position. I mean, after all, he had been visited by the angel of the Lord. He had, he had offered sacrifices to God, and God had accepted those sacrifices. So why couldn't he be this? I don't, let me tell you, because God hadn't called him to be the high priest. He is overstepping his boundaries here. God didn't want him to be. God wanted him to be the deliverer of his people. He fulfilled that role. But God did not call him to be the high priest. We see this happening in churches today. And by the way, of every denomination, you see this happening. We see unqualified men becoming pastors today. We see disqualified men remaining in the pastor. We see women neglecting what God's Word says and becoming pastors. We see homosexuals rebelliously denying God's Word and proclaiming themselves to be pastors. Same thing. 
Listen, anytime anybody oversteps, sidesteps, steps over God's Word, it can only lead to ruin every single time. And that's exactly where Gideon's request led. Look at verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod thereof, put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. It brought ruin to Gideon. Became a snare to Gideon. He became a hypocrite. Why? Because he was playing the part of a priest, but he wasn't a priest. And of course, because he was the leader, he led other people astray. He led them to do other wrong things. It brought ruin to Gideon's family. The ephod was a snare to his house, the Scripture says. There's some really bad things that happened to his family later on. You look in chapter 8, down in verse 31, and his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. That's a story in itself. You look in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, you find some other horrible things that happened there, all because Gideon chose to go in this direction. Listen, corrupt religion does not help the home. It destroys the home. Every single time, that's exactly what happened to his house. And then finally, Gideon's request brought ruin to his nation. Again, verse 27 says, All Israel went thither a whoring after it. Gideon had delivered Israel from the oppression of the Midianites, but he didn't deliver them from the root of the, their problems. When he died, they went right back to worship in Baal again. I mean, they barely got him buried, and they're already worshiping Baal again. You read about that in verse 33 of this chapter. What a warning that is for us. We can do all the good in the world for those in our life, those people, uh, people around us, people we don't even know. You can do all the good in the world physically for people. But if you don't direct any attention and solve the spiritual parts, the spiritual problems, you, you're, you're always going to pay a great We're, we're going to pay a great price for that. Our families will pay a great price for that. And even our nation will pay a great price. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing a nation that is beginning to pay the great price of this very thing. This very thing. And we're going to look at the price that Israel paid uh, for going in this direction next week. Well, let's pray together tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's, it, it never changes. We can always go to it and find something that we need, something that you desire for us to think about and pray about and implement in our life. Lord, your word changes us. Your, world, your, your word shows us the direction that, that you want us to go into. And Lord, I pray that we'd be wise enough to, to follow it, to be obedient to it. Lord, help us not to follow the pattern that we've seen tonight. This, this, this pattern of, 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 of a people that didn't put you first. That, that wanted a man to rule over them instead of a holy and righteous and omnipotent God. Lord, I pray that we would not follow the pattern of Gideon, overstepping our boundaries, not considering your thoughts, not considering your will, but doing what we wanted to do instead, going after what we want. Lord, help us not to do that. Lord, help us to be a people that seeks your face in every part of our life. Lord, help us to make you our King and our God and our Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.